Welcome to Write Good, the podcast that helps you write good. I'm Raquel Benedict, the most dangerous woman in speculative fiction. In this episode, we're talking about artificial intelligence. Not the sympathetic kind, played by Haley Joel Osment. Not the mean but hot kind, like Shodan, but the kind that generates content. There's been a lot of hype lately about the power of AI to create writing, visual art, and even music. Thank you, Harley, for your contributions. In this episode, Wendy Shu joins us once again to talk about the rise of the machines. Now, Wendy, your anti-AI content, anti-AI fiction, anti-AI art, and yet you yourself wrote a comic book about a girl falling in love with a hot android. How do you explain this hypocrisy? <laughs> Thank you, Raquel. That's, this is amazing. Thank you I'm for having me. I'm starting with the hard questions. Oh my gosh. Yes. So first of all, thank you for having me. A huge fan of the show. <laughs> I, it, it's really interesting. I feel like I began this book when I started writing it in 2018, when I started pitching it, I was maybe a little bit of a techno optimist because I had seen all, you know, the smartphone. I, I grew up during the mid 2000s with early social media and I was not really thinking about the uh, further conversation this book would be placed in, certainly not the context it will be coming out into, like this greater conversation about AI. But what I was really interested in was exploring the idea of the robot as the other and the themes of fighting against who, who your creator thought you would become. Which is interesting. This is one of the current themes that we are talking about if we kind of go into the history of Silicon Valley a little bit and these people who, starting with Leland Stanford, the the founder whose son, Leland Stanford Jr., the university was named after, and Leland Stanford himself was actually really into breeding the kind of most efficient racehorses. I got this tidbit from a recent oh. book I read called Palo Alto, A History of California, Capitalism, and the World by Malcolm Harris. So Stanford himself and his contemporaries who are all, well, first of all, let's go back to Stanford. He was really interested in breeding racehorses and breeding the most efficient, quote unquote, horses and how, and he was interested in not just breeding them to be the best, but to shorten the time that someone would have to invest in training the horse to make it a good racer or like like this rich the rich people hobby but like getting really into like right. horses <laughs> right but stanford and his contemporaries including the first president of the university were all this is kind of stanford's obsession with horses is not obviously not human eugenics but it's kind of horse eugenics and then later on the president of stanford was an actual eugenicist. So this idea that we can that we can engineer humanity to be mm. perfect and efficient and all of these things, that is kind of the backbone of Silicon Valley. And that is still very, very pervasive in their culture today. Like Elon oh, yeah. Musk. Yeah, like Elon Musk believes it's like the duty of people of quote unquote a certain stock to have children to, I don't know, make the world a better place. Um, yeah. Have yes. children and then neglect them horribly. Right. Apparently. And it's, but that's kind of how they see everybody, right? That's how they see the workers as like, oh, I am responsible for keeping you employed, but I'm not actually going to do anything to take care of you as, as an employer, as a human being. Um, so, I, oh, I'm sorry, he's Harley, so dramatic it's, today. It's, he is very He's in rare form. He's oh a big whiny boy because I didn't let him eat my chicken bone at dinner. Oh, and he's, he's so yelling in protest. He's still upset. So oppressed. Does he have an off button? <laughs> he does not. I'm sorry. No, no, it's okay. But um, so going back to this idea of the robot, I feel like in early science fiction, Asimov and his contemporaries, they were not maybe consciously tapping into the idea of eugenics perhaps but they were exploring these themes what does it mean to be human what does it mean to be made versus born especially in uh do androids dream of electric sheep and blade runner which 
I I've only read Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep once, but I've seen Blade Runner like a bunch of times. I feel like especially in Blade Runner, we're talking about how these beings were designed to live for seven years and then just be disposable and they were designed to just work. And the whole story of Blade Runner revolves around Harrison Ford's character as kind of the foil to Rucker Howard's character, Roy, and how Harrison Ford is maybe not even self-aware enough to realize that he himself is a robot with implanted memories, while Roy is very much aware of how much time he has left, of what he wants to do, and in that ending monologue he gives that tears in the rain monologue which was is so beautiful in the film about what he's seen as like and it kind of in that moment he is so human you know and so these are all themes that i personally love about robot fiction these are all themes that i decided to write about but to do that and i knew that this book would be in conversation with the greater with where we are in tech. So I had to do a lot of research about Silicon Valley. And the more I read about Silicon Valley and the more I researched, I realized, oh my God, these people are fucking evil. Yeah. They are, the more I read about Facebook, I read The Chaos Machine, which I highly recommend. It is uh, a kind of a overview of what social media has done to the world. Oh, God. A nonfiction. I read a, I read so many nonfiction books. I'm a big fan of the Tech Won't Save Us podcast because while I was listening to, because in the beginning of my research, I found Lex Friedman's podcast, which like cringe. He has become increasingly right wing and kind of fascist. It's quite sad to see his descent into this. Oh no. Yeah, but so, but to balance out Lex Friedman's podcast, I wanted to listen to some other perspectives, some tech critical perspectives. And I feel like these tech critical perspectives just really opened my eyes to how much we as a society have been deluded into buying whatever Silicon Valley decides to shovel at us. And right now we're in the middle of um, another tech hype cycle with the yeah. AI stuff. Yeah. Yeah, I, I know you mentioned it, and, and a bunch of people have made this observation that AI fiction, AI art is the current hype cycle, but right before this we had NFT as a hype cycle, and before that we had a, a different zillion different kinds of cryptocurrencies as a hype cycle, and that the people who were swearing, swearing that NFTs were going to change everything and that they were legitimately a good investment and that it makes a lot of sense to pay $50,000 for like a JPEG of an ugly monkey. A lot of these are the same people who are saying AI art will replace human artists. AI art is the future of culture. As I was just like, this is so stupid. These people who are so desperate to believe all this tech hype, they are just not living in reality have you have you been outside have you spoken to anybody like have you touched grass yeah it, it is especially weird to think that oh i'm going to make a lot of money by creating art like i have you ever talked to an artist do you, do you think <laughs> artists make a lot of money sadly i think these people see the success of like very few number of authors like stephen king or gross jk rowling and they see that oh she gets to live in a castle or whatever but it's not even about the art it's about it's just purely about greed because if you really love art you will know that part of that that deep love is in the process of making it and these people are so oriented on the product at the quote-unquote product i i hate saying a book is is a product because it's gone through right um the whole production design and stuff it is a product but it is also a quite affordable piece of art that you are holding and you can enjoy and i don't think these people see books and comics and and music as as art they see it as like oh this is the product i feel like if they could if they could AI, like, I don't know, some kind of beer or, or like a stupid little juice drink, they, they probably would. 
Right. I, I was listening to uh, Adam Conover and the guy from, I think his name is Dan from Folding Ideas talking about the tech hype cycle on uh, Adam Conover's podcast yesterday, Factually. And they were talking about how some of these more ludicrous AI headlines, such as like AI is going to revolutionize the way we shop for clothes or something. Huh. And it's like, how? How is it going to do? Like, once you start asking them questions, they literally cannot answer you. <laughs> yeah. So I think one issue, too, is we should probably define what we mean by AI writing and art. I know AI standing for artificial intelligence is kind of inaccurate because it, we don't really have artificial intelligence in a true sense. We don't really have a machine that can genuinely think. Mm -hmm. We just don't have it in us to build something that sophisticated just yet. Absolutely. Some really smart folks in tech, such as Emily Bender and Tim Nick Gebru, who has, have also been interviewed for like Tech Won't Save Us if folks want to listen to that. They have called this a stochastic parrot, which is basically the word calculator or in the terms of like the quote unquote, the art generator is like a picture calculator. It is generating things based on statistical probability. There's no real inspiration behind, there's no deeper thought. And yet these, these weirdos are, are, are worshiping it. Like it's a, I don't know, like it's a god or something, but it's like it's like a magic eight ball, but they're treating it like it's the Oracle of Delphi. <laughs> so what an AI does, say when it's making a picture, you, you ask an AI for a picture of a woman. What it does, I guess, is it scans or processes or whatever the term is, surveys a lot of pictures of women and does a statistical analysis and figures out, okay, the majority of pictures of women have a nose here, and hair that goes like this, and this feature here. Like, it's just finding out statistically what are the commonalities of this goes here, that goes there, that value goes there. It's not exactly imagining a woman, which is why a lot of times when you look at the details of these pictures, a lot of the details get really, really weird. I've noticed AI art has a lot of trouble with hair. Mm -hmm. Hair kind of sprouts randomly or, or turns into something halfway down. A, a ponytail will suddenly turn into loose hair halfway down. Joints, obviously hands are notoriously janky because hands are just really hard to draw. They're very, very difficult to draw. Again, I think this is, it's very notable that already we're seeing this AI quote unquote aesthetic. It's not so much an aesthetic as they as these uh, models took a ton of popular art pieces that are painted in this kind of airbrushed, hyper-realistic, anime-ish um, way. Well, they oscillate between hyper-realism and anime-ish, but they're all very painterly in quality, right? And they kind of just mash these together, these paintings, because they it's, it's a quote-unquote popular art style, like a commercial art style. And that's the kind of quote unquote, the now what we see as the as AI quote unquote aesthetic. Um, right. It has a very hard time from what I've seen with, well, it has a hard time. I know Sarah Anderson, poor Sarah Anderson's work has been fed into an AI generator and the, the, the way it tries to copy her cartoons is like truly nightmarish, mm. but it can't emulate yet a certain style very well but i mean even if it could for uh i mean i wouldn't be surprised if in the future it could be better at it i'm sure eventually someone will work out and teach the computer how to draw hands and hair right. probably right i i did see an incredibly depressing linkedin post where a woman at google has trained a model on a certain kind of art style to spit out things that look like like a flat cartoon in that style and it was i mean the the art that came out still looked really janky like bad finger placement the prompt was a tube of toothpaste like a cartoony tube of toothpaste i'm like that does not look like tube of toothpaste there was a dog with like a weird phantom limb but it at a very very basic level yes it ch could emulate the style and she was like, oh my god, this is so great, blah, blah, blah. And I'm just sitting there like, no. <laughs> no. 
that's the thing though how she was praising it in her shady little linkedin post as as kind of streamlining the process for designers as taking away these people fundamentally do not understand art they don't understand like you can there are parts of the process that you certainly can streamline for yourself but everyone's process is so different and the thought is a huge part of that the best analogy to it i've heard is it's like building a robot to fuck your wife for you <laughs> you're kind of missing the point yeah. you've removed yourself from the equation forgetting that no your participation is sort of the good part it's the important part oh my god that just reminds me of that drill tweet that was like well i'm gonna ai generate 250 million dollars and a wife who will listen to me <laughs> <laughs> i feel like at the core though these people are so lonely the people who really want to do the a the quote unquote the AI art and the AI writing. I, I kind of wonder if half of them resent the fact that the artsy poet kid got more pussy in high school than they did. <laughs> that I, fucking guy who played the guitar got more girls and I didn't. This right. is bullshit. I will have my revenge. I, and it's just, and it's also seeing the way they talk to artists is just this like oh this contempt, contempt and anger. And I'm like, okay, I'm sorry that. You decided to be a programmer or put yourself in a place where the the only art you feel, quote unquote, art you feel like you can do is by playing with these these things instead of sitting down and drawing a stupid little guy on a piece of paper. But I just wonder how hollow and empty one's life has to be to think that, oh my God, like I typed some words in and now I'm I'm a Da Vinci. I'm a genius. It's yeah. just so, it's so, I don't, I don't know. It's just pathetic, I guess. It's the word. Yeah. Now, here, here's a question. I, I've heard these things called plagiarism bots because they scrape from the work of other artists and sort of chew them up and puke them back out. Mm -hmm. What is the difference between an AI doing this to a, a data set of art or literature versus a human artist who every human artist takes influence from other works and we synthesize it and create it into new work what's the difference there with human art because these machines are not sentient there's there's intention behind human influence you read a beautiful piece of writing or you look at a beautiful piece of art and you think i want to try to incorporate that into my work and when it comes to artistic influence if i really love the way that an artist did their mark making, I'm going to try to emulate that mark making. I'm going to try to look at a lot of their compositions and try to bring that into my own, my own composition. You have to be able to experience the art first and foremost as a human being to, to make these intentional artistic choices. And I feel like a lot of times once again, these tech people are just fundamentally misunderstanding what it is to make art. They think, oh, there's no intention. When they see a, a painting some a person has done, they never ask or they never choose to ask, like, what was the choice behind this? But if you ask someone to talk about their process, there's always going to be choices behind yeah. whatever they do, right? Like, whether it's, like, um, certain descriptors in writing or whether it's certain kinds of lines or colors in art. But if you ask the AI, like, why did you choose this palette? It's not going to be able to tell you that. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. Now, I've heard people say that art, that AI art and AI fiction will democratize art and writing and help people with disabilities express themselves. What is your response to that? Good Lord. I know. So I know. I know. It's very, very bad faith. Just... This is always brought up by people who don't have disabilities and do not it's just seem so... to be up to date with with software that actually has been created to help people with disabilities write and do art. Because there actually is a lot of adaptive software and a lot of software and a lot of of devices that people with disabilities use to write like there's text to speech or speech to text which Absolutely. a lot of people who can't type can use that 
There's stuff you can use if you have trouble with your hands that will help you hold your hands steady if you're trying to make visual art. There are a lot of really wonderful tools for people with significant disabilities to allow them to create art, to allow them to communicate. Absolutely. And I think that this is just so disrespectful towards disabled people, <laughs> right? It's just incredibly disrespectful like to imply that disabled people don't make art. I highly doubt disabled people enjoy being used as a gotcha, right? Yeah. And second of all, there are so many disabled artists and writers. That just tells me that these people have never met like an artist period half of us have like have disabilities you know <laughs> yeah yeah and, and and i'm gonna point out I, a lot of these people seem to think that not being very good at writing is itself a disability like no not having writing talent isn't a disability that's a skill issue right and i think like i was just thinking of when you were it's talking about practice get good when you're talking about adaptive software, I helped a friend set up their iPad at the Apple store one time because of their visual impairment, because unfortunately there was no one at the Apple store available who knew how to do this. Oh no. And I was just like, like, that's more of a problem that there is no one at the Apple store who know who knew at this particular Apple store who knew how to set up an iPad for accessibility. And that we kind of had to sit there and do it. And, like, I'm happy to do that. But I was just like, that is, that's just shitty on the part of Apple. I feel like when we're talking about accessibility, <laughs> those are the things that need addressing. Not, like, look at this yeah. new technology. It always goes back to an issue of social support, right? Right. And on certain programs, such as Procreate, we can, if you have hand tremors, toggle line stability when you're making the line so that even if your hand is shaky, the line will come out smooth if that's the way you want to draw. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, it's really cool. There's so many. And then there's uh, features that let you create kind of perfect geometric tools. There's lots of brushes that will emulate. Because I know not everyone can use physical media. Some people need to be on the screen with the brightness cranked all the way up because that's the only way they can see how to, to make the art. And then there are... You can invert the colors if you're colorblind. There's just a lot of things that people can do yeah. to to make art if they wish to make art and to say that that's just such a gotcha. <laughs> like, yeah. A friend of mine used to be an assistant for a visual artist who was a quadriplegic. She would prepare the paint palettes for him and put the brush in his mouth and he would paint with like the brush in his mouth or attached to a rig on his head because he could still move his head. Right. Like, he legitimately made art that way. If you are that determined, if you have the heart of an artist, you will find a way to make it. Right. Because art is an addiction. Right. And also it is about for everyone who actually sits down to make art. The process is so important, right? Like, Yeah, the process is yeah. you. I feel like a lot of the AI people don't understand that your unique voice and your unique style and your unique process is what makes the art interesting. Um, right. And, and that can even mean, it can even mean if you're not a very good artist. I mean, one of the most popular comic strips online is, I, I don't know if you like this one, XKCD is literally stick figures. Oh, I yeah, absolutely. The guy I'm... can't fucking draw for shit, and he he's doing fine for himself. It's a well, wildly successful comic. I'm like, if you look at some of the art in the beginning of, of Mob Psycho, which is a really popular manga, it's not great, <laughs> but it has heart, you know? Like, yeah, the One Punch Man yeah. guy, he, he openly admitted at the beginning, yeah, I'm not very good at drawing. But, like, but that doesn't matter. He doesn't <laughs> let that stop him. And I, I think it's less about the process of making art. It's less about admitting, like, hey, I'm kind of bad at drawing, but I love it anyway. It's just, like, I want to be published, and I want a gallery show, and I want a million dollars for this. And they never stop to ask themselves why. Because they see artists as people with, quote, unquote, cultural clout, or mm. somehow as that they are... I don't know. It's like, have you met an artist? We're just, we're just a bunch of weirdos. Who... We're feral, man. Yeah, we're just a bunch of fucking weirdos, and we would rather we put our stuff on because, like, half the time when I put my stuff online, I'm like, here it is. Now I'm logging off. Do not perceive me. <laughs> like, yeah. But 
it's not that I am making and sharing art. Even if I did not have a career as an author, I would still be making art, you know? Even before the financial incentive to make art existed, people were making art. I, I remember before we started, you said you were determined to talk about a very old work of visual <laughs> art. So here is the chance. Here is the time. Oh, my God. So today I saw an amazing headline on one of the prehistory accounts that I follow. I am pulling up the headline. I have to read it to you. It is. I just I was like, this is so crazy. The headline reads the enigma of the LaSalle bird man, the erection that embodies the mysteries of prehistoric art. And I was like. <laughs> <laughs> the, the what like the uh, the bird man with an erection and i will send you the article so you can link it um, absolutely yeah it's a great but it's about i think this is rules that someone's cave boner painting like tens of thousands of years later is being discussed i know and i'm just like wow he drew a bird man with a bone like whoever this was they drew a bird man with a boner i'm like that is the most relatable thing i can think of as i'm scrolling through twitter and i see all this horny spider verse are of like miguel o'hara i'm like you know people have been sickos since the dawn of time i think that's amazing yeah i i just think it's really funny because all these anthropologists are you know very understandably trying to be like what does this mean is it related to <laughs> oh i'll read you uh from the hell from yeah from the article, is it related to shamanism? Is it a scene recounting a hunt gone wrong? Is the bird-shaped stick meant to propel a spear, or is it a wizard staff? Does it reflect something imagined or real? Is it a bird man or a dead man with his mouth open? And above what? all, it's like kind of a stick figure-y drawing. Huh. But it's so funny, this last sentence. And above all, what does the erect penis mean? I don't know. This just tickles me so much because we don't know. We simply don't know. We will probably never know, but we can imagine what the intentionality behind this was. And that's part of the fun of seeing older pieces of art, right? But yeah, I think I look at a lot of cave art just because I think that it's the perfect example of early cartooning. The very first cartoons, right? Yeah. Some really terrific line work on it. Mm hmm And um, the the beautiful, the shapes, the la the shape language is just so perfect. But yeah, I, so when I look at, when I look at this piece of cave art, I feel like I'm, I'm connecting to a shared human experience, even if the human experience is an ancient furry drew <laughs> like a bird man, <laughs> right? But an AI cannot emulate like an AI is, even if you put even if you use this piece of cave art as like a as like a, 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 a point of data to train the AI on there's never going to be that intentionality we're never going to wonder what was the meaning of this who did this because there is no there is no intentionality to the AI I agree Harley yeah Harley <laughs> yes yes he says Harley's intentionality is to disrupt this podcast every time I record. And to destroy everything. He's he's doing a very good job. Oh, he's we... a naughty boy. <laughs> yeah, I'll throw the toy for you. I'll throw the toy for you, you big whiny boy. Yeah, I'll throw it. You can fetch. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, go get it. All right. So here's the <laughs> here's the article, which is an ama it's just it's just it's just so great. I don't know. I, I saw this today. I'm constantly, I follow these prehistory Twitter accounts and occasionally they will post about old art. And I, I think that's amazing. How? Yeah, that rocks. Yeah, it's such a, but, but that's the thing. I'm like, did the person who painted the bird man with the boner on the cave wall, were they thinking about becoming rich and famous or... I don't know who were they like we don't even know who they were we just know that they left this behind as a very human expression of like I was here at the very least it says I was here you know yeah I think it's really beautiful and and just wonderful and fun 
So let's talk a little bit about why we're concerned about AI art other than just snobbishness. I mean, I think it's okay to be a snob personally. If you if you love something, you want it to be its best. Absolutely. So if you love art and fiction, you become a bit of a snob, not because you hate it, but because you want it to be its best. It's like how your parents get mad at you for not living up to your potential, not because they hate you, but because they love you and they think you're cool and special and they want you to do your best. Mm-hmm. I mean, at least if you have good parents, hopefully you have good parents who love you. This, is, <laughs> this does not apply to people with shitty parents. But in general, if you love something, you want it to be the best it can be. You you want to see it live up to its potential. So I think something a lot of people don't realize is that snobbishness doesn't come from hatred of a medium. It comes from love and respect of a medium. It comes from looking at a medium and saying, I know you can be amazing and great. Absolutely. Don't let me down. Don't, don't, you know, don't put out shit. (laughs) Right. And I mean, we critique things out of love, right? Yeah. A lot of times we see the potential in a comic or a piece of writing and we see, and I mean, sometimes it's a matter of of taste, but also sometimes it's a matter of the person's skill. And that's not a condemnation of who they are as a person, right? It's just, we're looking at a piece of art and we are engaging with it with our own experiences and our own you know for in the case of a lot of us the study of the craft and i i think that's amazing i think it, it's it's so much more beyond like oh this is this is a, a pretty painting or but that's the thing with these these specifically these picture generators but also to an extent with the writing ones at a, at a surface level it's like oh this is this looks good enough you know yeah but, yeah but then you start zooming in and it's it's completely off in a lot of ways. Yeah, the the style of prose in these things is really, really bland. It uses the same phrases or similes over and over again. Mm-hmm. It's super, super boring. Uh, so let's talk about what we think the actual threat is. I personally don't think that AI will completely replace human artists and human writers the way the hype machine says they are. Mm-hmm. But I think one thing they might do is they might be used to devalue genuine human labor. Absolutely. You get used to a content machine pumping out content at the speed of a machine for free or for very, very cheap. And you stop considering how long the resources it takes for an actual human artist to make this stuff. And you just sort of expect that kind of pace, that kind of prolificness for pretty much no money you can kind of see it with people who will sell covers for books now ai generated covers for self-published authors to use for their books they're selling covers for about like 20 bucks 15 bucks a pop Mm -hmm. if you are a real human artist designing an actual cover for a book 20 dollars a pop for a cover that's you're making less than a minimum wage it takes quite a bit of time to design right. a cover for sure and i think that the quote unquote the content that these that these things are fed these that these algorithms are given it's all ripped off anyway from human artists so you are stealing the work of human artists without compensating them and then you are frankensteining it and into something kind of i don't know i think it's illegible i think they look like shit to the untrained eye, I suppose they might look good enough, but like I really think they look like shit. Um, yeah, yeah, for me, I, I don't have as discerning an eye as you do because I'm just not a visual artist. I'll kind of glance at it and be like, that looks okay, and then I'll zoom in and be like, oh, wait, what the fuck? Her, her forearm isn't attached to her upper arm. What happened there? Her eyes are real <laughs> janky or something. <laughs> I think it also, there's a danger of the machine will generate quote unquote like a, a concept and then the designer in house has to go and fix it like they did with that one Paolini cover. Yeah. Um very unfortunate. Yeah, and I, I'm sure the person instead of paying a human artist to design a cover, what they'll do is they'll AI generate a cover and then pay a human artist way, way less money than you'd make to do a whole cover, just pay them a crappy pittance to fix the other one. So there is still a human touch to make it passable, but it's the touch of a human who's being paid absolute dog shit wages. Right. And that's not to mention that half the, actually a lot of these quote unquote AIs 
are there is no ai there are a bunch of underpaid people in the global south manually inputting this data that's not an ai that's just slave labor that's just exploitation and i read an article recently about a group of tech workers in kenya who have unionized which like hell you know, yeah hell yeah but that's the thing these these silicon valley companies want us to believe in the hype when really they are just repeating colonialism <laughs> yeah a whole lot of technology is is kind of held afloat by horribly underpaid employees often in the global south just right being paid horrible wages working under horrible conditions it's not really automated it's not and at the heart of it at the heart of it is the devaluation of everyone's labor right yeah the devaluation of therapist's labor of oh we're gonna get an ai therapist and, and an oh, ai God. doctor no you're not no you are not that one startup that rolled out the AI therapist for eating disorder treatment or whatever. Oh my god, and they had to shut it down. Yeah. Because it said incredibly horrible, harmful shit to their clients. Uh-huh. <sighs> but that's what they want you to believe. That's what yeah. Silicon Valley, these the people in charge of, the marketing people want you to believe. Like, a lot of this is just marketing. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but I am really worried that it can devalue human labor and also sort of lower audiences' standards when you're used to just this massive flow of content that doesn't ask you to look at it closely and is kind of low quality. You get used to that. Yes, absolutely. And, um, and I think there's a lot of forces in our culture that have been pushing that toward us too. Like the way, the way books are marketed based on a list of tropes that are kind of taken from – that are just basically product descriptions, product feature descriptions. I feel like it at, it led to this in a little bit of a subtle way. I think so too. I think that in general, media literacy is kind of hitting a big low and we can all thank George W. Bush and No Child Left Behind for that. Oh my God, I will never forget. <laughs> you know, there's yeah. a lot of things we won't ever forgive him for, but as an educator, as an artist, as someone who makes media, I will never forgive him. There's so many things contributing to this, right? There's the loss of the public online square for kids where they can just say their opinions and no one is, quote, retweeting them to dunk on them. Mm. Like, I don't think that teaches you anything because half the time I see a bad take and it's a, it's a kid. And that is just very unfortunate because I'm like, why are you not on club penguin <laughs> this idea that that every form of art simultaneously has to be taken seriously but also we can't be too serious about it yeah it's really muddling people's brains this whole debate over what is cozy horror uh. that had me as a person who wrote I'm sorry, the co-creator of like a children, a YA for like 13 year olds about a witch and a werewolf getting placed into cozy horror. I'm like, no, that is a children's book. Yeah. Please let these kids have something. I don't need you as an adult to take it seriously. You are not the target audience. But it's like they simultaneously want to be the target audience for things that are just not for them, like over the garden wall, like that's for children. Oh yeah. I love okay, it. Okay, so, yeah. so for those of you who are not in the right good discord, uh, recently the Mary Sue, yes, that website still exists, put out an essay about a debate about this, the concept of something called cozy horror. And it's argued uh, that Cozy horror is real. Horror can and should be cozy. And if you want your horror to be scary, you're actually a misogynist. And the reason we got a little obsessed with it is it actually quoted some of the members of our Discord and accused them of misogyny, including, like, several of the people they quoted were women, who, who I guess just hate women a lot because they like it when scary books are scary. And some of the examples of, quote-unquote, cozy horror they mentioned, this article mentioned, I believe, was... Your book, Mooncakes, right. and Over the Garden Wall, and both of these are literally media for children. They are literally 
<laughs> they're literally for children. I'm and they're like, both great. I mean, Mooncakes is wonderful, and Over the Garden Wall is a terrific show. But it's pretty weird for an adult to be going like, ah, oh, this is horror for me. Like, it is a, that is a children's cartoon it is for, li- for actual babies. But the thing is, this this flattening of, of media, this, I don't know. I'm just, I'm just going to say this gentrific, gentrification of, of genre, right? Having given it a little more thought as we're having this conversation, a lot of it is, especially with regards to the people cranking out this AI content, the fact that they feel that they are entitled to an audience. No one is entitled to an audience. I did not put my work on first, like a blog that was just floating out there in the void of the internet. Like I did not put my work onto this, onto my little blog with the expectation that I'm going to be rich and famous, that I'm going to have a book deal. None of these things were in my mind. I was a science major. I had the, the thought that maybe I would go to grad school after college. I never thought I was going to have a career in the arts. I just really liked to draw and I had a blog and the blog just happened to get an audience but i was never sitting there with the expectation that i was going to have an audience to begin with yeah i'm very glad that people connected to my work i think every creator not the not the people who play with these who you know put the schlock out online with these machines and whatever but i think every creator who enjoys making art and enjoys writing is always very grateful to have an audience. I know I'm very grateful to have an audience. Even if they miss even if a part of them recently misunderstood that the book was for children. Yeah. It's like, thank you. I'm glad that you read and enjoyed the book so much. But I feel like a lot of the people who do this AI art and writing who are kind of actively contributing to the schlock of the internet feel that they are entitled to an audience. Yeah. I'm thinking about the fact that sometimes the, a publisher will put just a lot of money into marketing for a book and the book flops anyway. Yeah. And other times the publisher puts no marketing into marketing money into a book and the book takes off. We don't control that. Those are not things we control, but somehow the people with these these quote-unquote these i don't even want to say they're tools these plagiarism machines are like Mm -hmm. if i take the most popular if i take shakespeare and lee bardugo and like i don't know stephen king and if i and i put them all into a machine and it spits out something that's like uh, an amalgamation of that i will uh, surely i will get an audience right and it's like no (laughs) Yeah, yeah, I mean, you might not get an audience, but one thing that is that is happening, I think, is that there is a threat of just the glut of AI content flooding out actual human artists and writers. I know Clark's World, which is a very prominent sci-fi fantasy magazine, had to temporarily close their submission portal because they were just flooded with tons and tons and tons of AI submissions, just tons and tons and tons of really shitty machine generated stories that it takes resources to go through all that your slush readers have to read all that shit and they just couldn't keep up so they had to shut down and that's a real shame for actual human writers who might want to get a story in clark's world i I forget the name of a mag i know another sci-fi fantasy mag had to shut down to had to shut down their slush pile and had to go to solicited stories only Right. Basically, they would only be able to get stories from peop- from writers they already knew. So if you're a newbie writer trying to break in, that really fucking hurts you. It because does. the editors don't know you. They don't know your name. It, it's going to do another... It, it's tearing out another rung at the bottom of the ladder up, which is a real problem for starting writers, especially a writer who might not have the money to go to the networking events where you'd meet other writers and editors and form those connections. If you are like a broke person or a person with a very busy schedule, Mm -hmm. all you can do is send out your stories. And if these portals close because they're overwhelmed by AI submissions, that really hurts you. Absolutely. It is the fault of these grifters. 
I think folding ideas or someone on that section of YouTube did a really deep dive into these book grifters who are like, I make like $2,000 a month in passive income by, well, before it was hiring ghostwriters and now it's AI generating stories and putting them on Amazon. And I, I genuinely hope that the industry, there's just so many different like threads at play interwoven here there's the grifters who are trying to convince people that you are going to make big bucks off of art which is like the most laughable thing i can ever imagine it's so unfortunate i don't know how they're going to fix the submissions problem i hope i sincerely hope they do because like you said it is so important to have these open calls like especially in short fiction publishing there's not a lot of avenues to begin with no so i hope i i don't i mean i can't make any predictions i i do hope that as the hype cycle dies down this stops being as much of a problem i'm sure it will con- yeah i'm sure it will continue to be a problem in some way but i hope that if anything this pushes people to be maybe a little bit weirder with the kind of work <laughs> that they do <laughs> Um, yeah yeah that's that's my my get weird with it get weird make art that is kind of i don't want to say that is like stylistically very different from these 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 pastel Mm. painterly generated things right so that's a feature of art of ai art because it's sort of statistically generated it makes art that's kind of bland and another i think under discussed aspect is that it often really reproduces a lot of the prejudices of our larger culture, like sexism. If you ask an AI to produce a picture of a woman, a lot of the time it'll generate a really weirdly hypersexualized image of women Mm -hmm. because it's drawing from the data set of the internet and the internet is full of weird pervs. So a lot of the data set is these hypersexualized picture of women. So if you ask an AI to generate a picture of a man and a woman, the man will be kind of normal looking and the woman will be just like titties a popping. Right. It's it's also <laughs> it's just so unfortunate that they will then these companies will then hire people to quote unquote clean up the data sets. So you have people who are incredibly underpaid picking through the worst images on the internet in an attempt to quote unquote better the algorithm, which once again, that doesn't make it AI then, does it? Because the machine is not like, oh, this is sexist and this is, you know, I should not draw like this. The machine is quite, it doesn't think, it just right. spits. But yeah, it's. it also goes back to the idea of optimizing the process, solving for creativity. And it's like, this is the one thing that human beings have that tech people we don't need to solve creativity right and like this isn't a labor we need to eliminate we're supposed to eliminate the boring shit so that we can do cool creative stuff this is like eliminating the fun stuff so we can code more or do boring bullshit and look at spreadsheets i don't like that i yeah right and it's also like solve for creativity for who you know like we we always gotta ask for who because for yeah. people who make art and for people who write, the process is so important and it's... Yeah, while yeah. you're writing, the story changes because ideas are almost worthless. I love AI people because they'll say, finally, I, ha- I have a way to bring my brilliant ideas to fruition. And their brilliant ideas are always like, anime girl with big titties holding a sword. <laughs> like, wow, that's an amazing idea. Or like... Really an... incredible idea. No one else could have come up with that. Right. But as, as you yourself are drawing the picture or as you yourself are writing the story, it always changes because you realize, wait, this, this idea isn't quite working or the story is going in this direction and I'm having a lot of fun with this direction and I'm going down a place I didn't plan to go down. And it, the act of creation is itself a process of discovery. And mm-hmm. the idea, your initial idea always it, it warps massively from what the end result is. And the end result is usually a lot more interesting. (laughs) It is. And I don't think these people understand that every mark you make is deliberate. As an artist, you know, every line I make, that's a a choice that I make. 
whether it's conscious or subconscious because sometimes you'll read a story that you've written and be like oh these themes were there that i didn't i wasn't really consciously thinking about like maybe you, you but maybe you were percolating them and it, it can be like a really fun process of self-discovery that way but like what are you gonna get from reading your idea put into a word generator like if i put the idea into the word generator you know like white man his girlfriend is dead he has to like solve a mystery of i don't know who killed his girlfriend what is that right. teaching me about myself i think another weakness is that they only interact with other it's only coming from other media it's not coming from any kind of personal experience which is usually you put some of yourself into your art and that's what makes it kind of special and interesting mm -hmm. and a machine cannot do that and then there's the other side of that the ai can't engage with the real world so it can't really fact check which has been a huge problem for students who've been trying to use an ai generated text to write essays there was a famous case in new york state a lawyer named stephen schwartz used uh, chat gpt which is a text generating ai to write a legal brief for him Mm -hmm. The brief it wrote contained references to legal cases that do not exist. It is? And that's really fucking bad. You are not allowed to do that in a court of law. And as a result, Stephen Schwartz is now in like massive fucking legal trouble for doing that. I hope he gets disbarred. It is, it is a really serious offense. And the judge is just tearing him a new asshole in court right now. Um, which he should because that's shockingly, shockingly unprofessional and shockingly negligent. <laughs> Even when I worked at a law firm, writing briefs with the senior partner, because he was very old school, he would really enjoy dictating things or he would handwrite them and have me type them up for him. But he enjoyed the process of writing briefs because he got to be funny and weird. Oh, that's kind of fun. It is fun. He was kind of an asshole in a couple of different ways. But I, I liked that about him. He genuinely enjoyed like getting to be creative within the confines of like writing these legal briefs yeah. yeah you know it's really fun to watch someone in, who's good at their work really get into it it's a it's a wonderful thing right and it's like um that is correct harley <laughs> yes harley that's right what if i what if i generated a robot to play fetch with harley for him I think he would like that, right? You would be optimizing the process of... Uh, I don't think so, because I think a lot of the process is interacting with me and bonding with me and annoying me specifically. I think he he gets a lot of pleasure out of driving me crazy, mm. and that's a really important process of the, of, of the act of playing fetch. So if I built a robot to do that, it, it would miss that. It, it would miss that he can't annoy a robot the way he annoys me. That's very true, actually. What was I going to say? There's also the, the a very recent article about how these data sets are already kind of eating each other because they are being trained on other AI data. Oh. So it's like making a photocopy of a photocopy. And as you continuously make photocopies, the quality of the thing degrades, right? One of the studies they cited in this article, which... I kind of rolled my eyes out towards the end because it was trying to be a little a little uh, AI optimistic for my taste by saying there will always be a need for humans because we can the humans will be generating the data and I'm like N no that's what mm. an asinine thing to say but if the internet is flooded with garbage then these the machine training data is also garbage so I hope that will render some of these things absolutely useless I hope so too. Harley, calm down, Jesus, <laughs> buddy. But it's all to. I think. I think the thing that everybody has to remember is that this ties into Silicon Valley's kind of long-term goal of these te specifically tech executives of making us give them a lot of money. Yeah. Um, yeah, like we are the product. Nothing can work without humans. We are using the internet. We are using the hateful, dying bird platform. We are using Instagram and Meta and the all of these things that are now becoming increasingly unusable because they cannot wring three cents more out of what they already have because there's only so far you can go. Yeah. So I hope that this kind of 
tech hype cycle is a wake up call for a lot of people into realizing, oh, wait, they tried to do this last year with like crypto and NFTs. Yeah. Um, and the metaverse. <laughs> and and I am seeing. I know there are some artists who are who are taking part of it, and I'm really fucking furious at seeing the number of writers who were using AI generated covers like that fucking if you're gonna do that just pay for a stock photo or oh something oh my god also, it's, no labor solidarity it's you know? yeah that's really disappointing because especially because at the beginning you'd see people doing that and and we'd be like hey you know you're next right you know text AI is next right and now it is and now those same writers are freaking out I don't know what you fucking expected buddy I just I don't know but but I am seeing a, a good number of writers and artists fight like that. I know that some that when Tor put out that AI generated cover by Paolini, they got a lot of shit for it, which is really really good. And I've seen publishers announce, "Here's the cover of this new book," and people notice like, "Ooh, that's AI generated! Don't you fucking dare!" No, you don't. Yeah. And like giving them shit for it, which is really 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 encouraging, actually. I absolutely think that we should be. That we as readers, and I, I hate the term consumers, as but as people who experience art that is made by, that is partially produced by companies, we should absolutely be pushing back. We can be as hard on the industry as possible. Yeah. Right? Like. Yeah. It, it, I know a lot of people are, some people are afraid of critiquing an artist or a writer because it seems mean, but. You're not going to hurt a machine's feelings. It's okay. You can you can insult the AI machine and the company that's using it because they don't have emotions. They're not people. They're not people. I think it is so – I think this this whole atmosphere also of being late capitalism and being led to believe that companies are people, that has also led to some of this hesitation to critique yeah. or push back. And we absolutely have to push back. If the social media person managing – the account that posted the the cover like they're not going to take it personally yeah yeah but we absolutely if we want to preserve art we have to push back on this schlock and we have to make room for people to i think also you know it's very sad but i think a lot of people just don't know how to experience art anymore like a lot of people just like yeah have never gone to a museum and that's that's and they don't know how or they or they see like a, an old painting and they get really intimidated. And it's like, no, you know, we can look at the painting of the bird man with the with the cave painting of the bird man with a dick. And, and if if the way you want to engage <laughs> is to be like, wow, that's so relatable. Absolutely. You know? yeah. uh, and I I see this a lot when I'm working with kids who are kind of hesitant to engage with what we think of as fine art. But when we show them, I like to show, I, I just did a workshop recently where I showed a bunch of middle schoolers this this old Chinese bronze pig pot with the it's just a cute little guy. And I showed them and I showed them how that was an inspiration for like a character design. And they oh. thought it was very great. But I think that it's, I think that looking at art on any level is really good for you and making art yeah. is really is really great for you i think it's so wonderful to be able to look at a cave painting a carving god bless uh an account called ancient furries on twitter posts a lot of fine art of human <laughs> animal people like, but i think yes that's a really great gateway into into appreciating weird art because... medieval guys are really fun yeah i love Weird I love the little guys. weird medieval guys. Like here's a here's a weird ass drawing of a little guy from a medieval manuscript. There it is. Yeah, I think all of these accounts and all also all the museum accounts that are freely available and will post photos and reproductions from their collection, I think those are really valuable to get like art appreciation to the general public. If there's a museum in one's area that has a low cost admission or sometimes you can your library card sometimes will get you free access to a number of museums. But yeah, I think if, if people have the time, they should absolutely go to a museum. Because part of making art and being a human being who does those things is that it is such an embodied process. Yeah. As uh, an artist who does primarily digital work for 
my books just because it it does take a shorter amount of time there are parts of the process that i have quote unquote streamlined however i do a lot of traditional painting and sketching and drawing because there are things that i get from just putting a line on a piece of paper that is very different from putting a line of a similar weight and fluidity onto my tablet screen and i think that a lot of people see the cool drawing but they don't they don't see just how tactile the process is and i think it's really important to remember that art making is an embodied process and the machine cannot cannot do that because every pain stroke you see is someone with their hand or their mouth or holding the brush between their toes making that mark deliberately yeah that is just important to remember and they move their body to create this kind of this kind of this kind of mark there's a big conversation right now in comics about how hard this industry is on your physical body that a lot of publishers who are, who just are unfamiliar with the process, but also publishers who are familiar with the process, like they just do not understand how much of a toll it takes on your physical body to sit and make that art. And this is a conversation that we, that I feel like maybe it would not be necessarily so pressing if a lot more of these people in charge at publishers, these executives, these a lot of our editors who have mostly edited prose, if they sat down themselves to make the art, I feel like even just making one illustration, they would understand that it yeah. is such an embodied process, you know? Yeah. Yes, Harley, it's a very embodied process. I'm picking him up and giving him a squeeze because he's oh. being a whiny baby right now. That's okay. You can use yeah. him as a paintbrush. <laughs> yeah. He's fluffy enough. Good boy. Okay. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so it's been about an hour. Why don't we wind down? Before sure. we go, what are some things you'd like to promote of yours? Well, hilariously, in August, I have a young adult sci-fi graphic novel coming out called The Infinity Particle, and it is about a girl who falls in love with a robot. But I think more importantly, it is about what it what does it mean when your parent wants you to be made a certain way or to be born a certain way? And what does it mean when you come into sentience as a as a person and decide that that's not who you want to be? Like what happens then? I was very deliberate about all my artistic choices in this book from the color palette to the way the lines are drawn and I am so proud of how it turned out so I hope that people who love comics will go and pick it up and I have several other books for children. I have Tide Song which is a middle grade fantasy graphic novel about a young witch and a dragon and I also have Moon Cakes which is about a witch and a werewolf. Which is a shocking horror story. A apparently. horrible, <laughs> terrifying. I actually, <laughs> in the future I would love to do a horror. I think it's so fun. And also, if people want to read something that is already out, I just finished Cursed Bunny by Bora Chung. It's a translation. It's a work in translation. Bora Chung is a Korean writer. These are all short stories that she had written. It is seriously some of the best speculative fiction I've read in a minute. Also, some of the most disturbing. The first story is about a woman who is haunted by her own waist, and it's just like so interesting and so what? disturbing. You have to read it. <laughs> this sounds really sick. I gotta read this. It is. It's amazing. Um, What's it called again? And who's the writer again? It's called Cursed Bunny. Cursed uh, Bunny. By Bora Chung. By Bora Chung. Yes. That sounds uh, pretty great. It's amazing. I could not put it down. She is so good at this just like tonally they're all so different and she's pulling from lots she's pulling from folklore and and um horror and sci-fi there's a human centipede robot story that will haunt me forever now <laughs> oh holy fuck yeah that sounds sick it is so sick her brain is so big an ai will never be able to do what she does <laughs> but that's the thing right you say something like a well, this story is about a woman haunted by her own waist, and you tell an AI to write it, and they're never going to write what Bora Chung has accomplished here. 
No. Mm -hmm. So definitely not. Um, thanks so much for having me. This was so fun. Thanks for coming on, and thank you for accepting the voice of my cat. Hello, you naughty boy. He's finally quiet. I know. An hour of screaming. <laughs> He's tired. He screamed himself out. Oh, well. Goodness. Thank you all for listening. If you like what you heard, head to patreon.com slash write good and subscribe. Until next time, keep writing good. This has been Write Good with Raquel S. Benedict. Hosted by Raquel S. Benedict and produced by Matt Keeley for KS Media LLC. Theme song by OK Glass. For comments and concerns, please write to us at writegood at kittystasis.com. That is R-I-T-E-G-U-D at kittystasis.com. If you'd like to support us, please visit our Patreon at patreon.com slash write good. This has been a Kitty Sneezes production. Kittysneezes.com in color. Wow.